Hello, this is Paul Humber. It's December 28, 2018, just a few days before the new year, 2019. And uh, this is about Thomas Hobbes, and uh, who is a Christian, uh, who also professed conditional immortality. Now, he's a 17th century philosophy philosopher, uh, and he, one of his masterworks was a book called Leviathan. And in that book, I want you to see that he is identifying with Christianity. I'm quoting from his book. Some, some people question, think maybe he was some kind of an atheist. Well, uh, these words are not words of an atheist. Here's the quotation. Quote, But though our Savior, notice the word our, but though our Savior was a man whom we, notice the word we, also believed to be God, immortal, and the Son of God, yet this is no idolatry because we build not that belief upon our own fancy or judgment, but upon the word of God revealed in his scriptures. Now, these words that I just read are words of faith, and they display core Christian beliefs. In other words, the deity of Christ. And also do these following words, again from his book Leviathan, page 315. And ask me, I'll get, send you the link. The whole book, book is, is online. Again, so I'm quoting again Thomas Hobbes, who by some are sort of thinking, well, maybe he was uh, some kind of an atheist. These are not words of an atheist. Quote, quoting Hobbes, the comparison between that eternal life which Adam lost and our Savior by his victory over death has recovered holdeth also in this, that as Adam lost eternal life by his sin, and yet lived after it for a time, so the faithful Christian has recovered eternal life by Christ's passion, though he die a natural death and remain dead for a time. Not only was Thomas Hobbes a, a professing, identified with Christianity and Christian doctrine, but he also believed he was a creationist. He believed Adam really was there, and he contrasts Adam with Christ. So this brother in Christ also held immortality to be for believers only. Now this is the second part of that line up there where it says Prophet Thomas Hobbes professed conditional immortality. What, what, is, what is conditional immortality? Well, it is not unconditional immortality that Plato uh, promoted. He said that man's soul is immortal. He was wrong. Uh, play, and plus, Christians shouldn't be getting their instruction from Plato. So, this is what he wrote. Quote, second line there. That the soul of man is in its own nature eternal and a living creature independent on the body or that any mere man is immortal otherwise than by the resurrection on the last day except Enoch and Elijah is a doctrine not apparent in Scripture. Thomas Hobbes was a Bible believer. He believed Jesus was God. And he's talking about immortality here, and he's disagreeing with Plato and affirming the teaching of the Scriptures. Now, a Wikipedia article on Christian conditionalism offers these words. 
Quote, Mortalist writers such as Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan have often argued that the doctrine of natural, natural or innate immortality stems not from Hebrew thought as presented in the Bible, but rather from pagan influence, particularly Greek philosophy and the teachings of Plato or Christian tradition. Maybe he's thinking of Tertullian around 200 AD there. Because Tertullian sort of put his arm around Plato on the immortality of the soul concept. And in support, uh, it references uh, from a book, page 380, Springborg, the Cambridge Companion to Hobbes's Leviathan. And here's a quotation. It is Plato, not Moses who taught the existence of an immortal soul. So Thomas Hobbes, not only a brother in Christ, it would appear, but also has the very concern that I've been promoting in the last several years. I've got various videos up about this, and, and it's uh, encouraging to have this philosopher uh, long ago affirming the very concerns that I have. That doesn't mean that I have not advanced a little bit beyond his thinking. He didn't have he he didn't have the insights perhaps about the meaning of the word Ionius, but let's move on. More than a hundred pages later, in that book, Leviathan, Hobbes wrote, quote, Another general error is from the misinterpretation of the word eternal. That's that word Ionius in the Greek or Olam in the Hebrew. That's the, that's the concern. So he even identified a bit of a problem here. He didn't uh, spell it out, as I have done in two books and all, but, but nevertheless, he's, he's right on. It's from misinterpretation of the words eternal life. And, of course, he's referring, presumably, to the original language. The Bible was not written in English. So the word eternal or everlasting is only a translation of the two key words. In Greek, again, it's Ionius. In, in Hebrew, it's Olam. And the second death. For though we read plainly in Holy Scripture that God created Adam in an estate of living forever which was conditional, so there's that conditional immortality coming in explicitly from Hobbes. That is to say, if he disobeyed not his commandment, which was not essential to human nature, but, and we go to the next slide, consequent to the virtue of the tree of life. In other words, Adam had access to the tree of life, but then he was cast out. So he no longer is going to be able to eat of the tree of the life and, and live eat presumably eternally. So resuming the quotation here, by virtue of the tree of life, whereof he had liberty to eat as long as he had not sinned, and that he was thrust out of paradise after he had sinned, lest he should eat thereof and live forever. In other words, he did not have natural immortality. It was conditional. And that Christ's passion is a discharge of sin to all that believe in him. In other words, the loss of immortality, Jesus' passion is a discharge for those who believe in him. In other words, they return to life, eternal life. And by consequence, a restitution of eternal life to all the faithful and to them only. Notice, not everyone has immortality, according to Hobbes. Only those that are, are faithful in Christ. So Plato was wrong. Unbelievers don't have the immortal soul. Uh, you know, that's my insertion here, but it's right in harmony with the, what Hobbes is saying. Continuing the quotation, 
Yet the doctrine is now and has been a long time far otherwise, namely, that every man hath eternity of life by nature inasmuch as his soul, and I say, I insert supposedly, and that's what really Hobbes is saying, inasmuch as his soul is immortal. In other words, he's clashing the scriptural teaching with Plato. And he's dealing with that word, it often translated eternal or uh, everlasting. Now, he used the word otherwise in the previous slide. Uh, he was referring to the prevalent then and even now among evangelical Christians and Reformed Christians. And so it's prevalent even now. But he was referring to the prevalent then and even now view. But it seems he assumed that everlasting was, is a good rendering for the Greek, Ionius. But it is not. The Greek word means lasting and is durationally indeterminate. In other words, it can refer to temporal things or eternal things. It's not fixed. And that's why we should, use, we should use the word lasting, because that also is not fixed in duration. It can refer to eternal things as well as temporal. So let us translate with equivalency. Choose an English word that parallels the Greek word Ionius or the Hebrew word Olam. And lasting is that word. Notice the lasting Bible to the right. The English translation thus should be equivalent to the Greek, but it is not. Forever is not durationally flexible. But both Ionius, Greek, and lasting English are. Both can accommodate durational variants, sometimes temporal and sometimes eternal. Same with Olam in the Hebrew, and there are 439 uses of Olam in the Old Testament. So this is a significant issue. This is just not one or two verses. Uh, Olam is associated, for example, with the dur duration of Jonah in the whale or fish, fish's belly. Well, we all, re all know that he was there for three days and three nights. That's not infinity. He was not in the aquatic animal's belly forever or everlasting. It's absurd. And similarly, the word is used, Olam, is used of the Aaronic priesthood. Well, that's not everlasting. Circumcision, that's not everlasting. And hell, that's not everlasting. Hell, there is punishment. But it is not everlasting. Be why? Because Jesus taught otherwise. He referred to, he taught otherwise in Luke 12, where he talked about few and many stripes. He never said infinitely many stripes. And secondly, he also in Matthew 10, 28, said that don't fear to those that can destroy the body, but the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Platonists say, oh, no, 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 no. You can't destroy the soul. We know it's immortal. Wrong, Plato. Jesus was bullseye there in Matthew 10, 28. Are we going to believe Jesus? Or Plato. Now, sometimes I get enthusiastic. Please don't be offended by my enthusiasm here. Uh, because, you know, this is important. That's why I'm doing this video. I want people to realize. I want my brothers and sisters who are evangelical or reform, or whatever, I want them to finally come on board. I've received tremendous resistance. You know, they don't want to talk with me, whatever. And I think it's maybe partly they don't know how to answer the que the concerns that I bring. So on page 445 in Hobbes' book, Leviathan, he affirmed, and I'm quoting Hobbes again, but there be other places in the New Testament where an immortality seems to be directly attributed to the wicked, which he realizes that clashes with with those words, for example, maybe he didn't think of Luke chapter 12 as much. I don't know. 
But let's continue to read Hobbes. For it is evident that they shall all rise to judgment. I agree with that. And it is said besides in many places that they shall go into everlasting. That's that word, Ionius. So he's struggling with this Greek word, Ionius. He didn't realize that it's been mistranslated. It should be lasting fire, lasting torments, and lasting punishments. That's Matthew uh, 25, 46. You see a diagram. That's Jesus separating the uh, goats from the lambs and all. And he said they will go into Ionius punishment. But it's been mistranslated with everlasting punishment. No, it's, ever, it's lasting life and lasting punishment, but they, that word has durational, is not durationally fixed. And that's why lasting is such a good translation, is everlasting is bad. Now I'm continuing to read Hobbes. And that the worm of conscience never dies. And all this is comprehended in the word Ionius, or everlasting death, which is ordinarily interpreted everlasting life in torments. And yet I, and he's speaking for himself, but this is Hobbes, and yet I can find nowhere that any man shall live in torments everlastingly. Now that's what he was saying, and he may have had Luke 12 in mind and Matthew 10, and so on, Christ's words. So he, he didn't really, he didn't know how to deal with that word Ionius. Uh, and he's struggling, and that's, that was my struggle. I used to believe what he, that, that the word was properly translated. I discovered otherwise. And, uh, you know, people say, who do you think you are? You know, uh, I, it's presuming to think you could correct the, the translation everlasting. Well, I, I just think that I, I'm a believer and I want to obey Christ and I want to believe him. I want to believe what he said in Luke 12. Apparently many people don't believe that, that Jesus spoke of many and few stripes and that that cannot be infinitely many. But I believe Jesus. And also, I believe Jesus when he said that the soul can also be destroyed in hell as well as the body. They say, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus destroyed, that doesn't really mean. It means non-destroyed in hell. Kept from being destroyed. That's not what Jesus was saying. And so Thomas Hobbes is sort of like, as far as I'm concerned, my buddy here. Because I, I like what he's saying. And he's right on. A very concern that I have. I'm not saying it's identical. <clears throat> Again, he, Hobbes, was struggling with the mistranslation everlasting. It is said that translators have used everlasting rather than lasting. He may not have been aware that the sovereign Lord Jesus actually nullified the mis mistranslation in Luke 12, 46, 47, 48, and I've already discussed it. And Matthew 10, 28, I've already discussed that. There, Jesus taught proportional punishment and eventual cessation of being for the wicked. The word often mistranslated everlasting with durational inflexibility means lasting. Now, if, if this is new for you, there are two books that I have put together, and that doesn't mean that everybody's been happy with them, but many people have been encouraged by them. Uh, the one is called Terminal Hell, Eternal Paradise. In other words, God's people get immortality, but not those going to hell. On, on the basis of Jesus' words, many and few, it doesn't say infinitely many. Jonathan Edwards says infinitely many, but in, Jonathan Edwards, even though I regard him as a brother in Christ, he, he wrote some unworthy things about hell. Uh, you know, that one sin, he, he wrote one sin is worthy of infinite punishment. The Bible nowhere says that. So why should he assume that he knows? He doesn't. He didn't. He was wrong. I'm not saying he was wrong in everything. 
But he was wrong on that point. And, 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 I, and that probably sounds arrogant for me to say that. And the other book is Levin in the Long Run. I'm dealing with every issue of Olam in the Old Testament, which is often mistranslated forever or everlasting or whatever, or eternal. It's not. That's not what it means. And I've already said that there are some things that, uh, you know, it, it can have a, a temporal or an eternal. When it applies to God, it's appropriate. It's okay. Often the word, however, is doubled up when they really mean something much longer than a temporal lasting. Or they can, there's a way of adding a Hebrew word, ed, to the, the olam word, and that also conveys the idea of everlasting. That would be much more appropriate in those contexts. And there are a very good number of places like that. But most often, the word is used in, by itself. And when it's used by itself, it definitely shouldn't be mistranslated, eternal, or ever, everlasting. So if you want much more, you, you're welcome to get both, one or both of those books where you can learn about other famous people who were conditionalists. In other words, like Thomas Hobbes and I are, are conditionalists. Immortality only applies to the believers in Christ, not to unbelievers in hell. And who are some of these? Well, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon, which is in France, defender of the faith Athanasius, one of the greatest uh, warriors for Christ in the early church, affirming the deity of Jesus Christ. Athanasian was a conditionalist. Martin Luther, William Tyndall, you mean William Tyndall who was behind the English draft? Yes. He was, he was a conditionalist. William Gladstone, Richard Weymouth, Harriet Beecher Stowe, C.S. Lewis, Clark Pinnock, F.F. F. Bruce, John Stott, Philip Hughes, and many more. So I encourage you to get that book, or one of, maybe both of those books. And it's not because I'm trying to make money. I'm not making money on those books. I want the truth to get out. This is the last slide. Where do we go from here? If you are troubled and you say, ah, I don't, Paul is must, must be a heretic, feel free to write to me at paulhumber at verizon.net. I give you my email. You say, uh, I disagree with you, but I don't talk with heretics. Well, I'm not a heretic. I, I love Jesus. I'm trusting Jesus to be my savior. He conquered death. He's God in human flesh. He's the God man. He's the, the, uh, my, my, the, the sovereign of the universe. He created all, everything. And, and yet, I also believe him in Luke 12 and in Matthew 10. So you, feel free to ask me a question. Or, if you're encouraged by this, offer to say, Paul, how can I help? I, I want to help you out. You're, you're against a juggernaut that's about 18 centuries long. That's huge. And so let me know how I can help you out. The world is in turmoil. We all face death. God has his book out. We call it the Bible. Jesus is the only solution to death and future judgment. There's no other religious leader that conquered death. No other person conquered death like Jesus did. Sure, there are many mockers, but what did they ever do for you? Jesus made you and came to earth to be the Savior. That's uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, which says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your wonderful coming into the world. Father in heaven, I thank you that you did not spare your own son, but freely gave him up for us all. How will you not, along with him, freely give us all things? We worship you, Father. We worship you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, Father, Son, for your Holy Spirit. Lord, use this video with all its limitations for your glory that people might relinquish their grip 
on platonic poison. Get rid of it and believe Jesus, your son, instead. That uh, he is just in the way he will punish sin. And uh, many few with eventual extinction. And help people to, who believe the Bible to read it, to love you with all their mind, soul, body, strength, and really study this to get it right. <coughs> we thank you, Lord. Forgive us for our sins and renew us in your love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.